Welcome to the Rediscovery Channel. This is the channel where I, Ivor Kovac, and my good friend Stilgar take turns coming up with topics from history that the other person doesn't know about and often hasn't heard about. So today it is my turn and I want to talk about uh, Sigaria Rock, also known as just Sigaria. So have you heard of this place before? No, I have not. No. Okay. So Sigaria is in Sri Lanka, which is that big island to the south of India. Um, the name originates, like uh, the name comes from the words Sinha Giri, which means lion rock. And it is a big volcanic plateau that is about 590 feet tall, though it's not uh, completely level at the top. And that translates to 180 meters. Um, um, just one question. Mm -hmm. um, did you say lying, like laying down, or lion, like lion, the animal? Lion, like the animal. Okay. okay. The king okay. of the jungle. Yes, because yeah. I, I, I thought you said lying, like it was laying. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't think there's any more lions in Sri Lanka today, but it seems like in the ancient world there was a greater, you know, there were lions in more parts of the world uh, than there are now, but yeah. a lot of people use them for mascots and such, you know, on flags and things like that. Um, but at any rate, uh, this, I mean, this they, they were even in uh, Israel, right? So yeah, in the Bible, like in the Old Testament, it talks about there being lions, but I'm pretty sure if you go to Israel today, there are none. No, um, yeah. except for the zoo. Yeah, yeah people kind of. You know, sharing a space with a lion is not really that uh, feasible, especially if you're trying to raise cattle and such. Um, yeah, and they do eat people as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, they yeah. will eat his meat. Yeah. So a lion doesn't care if you're uh, sentient or not. He just wants to eat. Um, but at any rate, yeah, so this uh, there's a reason why they call it Lion Rock. Um, and actually... So first of all, the surrounding area, if you if you go there today, it's a tourist place. Um, you can go there and walk through it. The surrounding area is mostly forest. It kind of looks like a tropical rainforest to me. You can see this great plateau sticking up above the forest like a table. Um, and it's believed that the surrounding area was inhabited as early as the 10th century BC. Um, during the third century BC, they, the, the rock was inhabited by Buddhist monks who mostly lived in caves. And according to the sources, they had something called a drip ledge, which I'm not entirely sure what that was. Uh, I'll try to put some pictures in the slideshow. Mm. So it functions as a monastery as far as the earliest records of this place go. And there's some inscriptions called the Brachmi, Brachmi rock inscriptions, which shed some light on how these people lived during this time. However, uh, the area is the most famous for the structures that were built by King Kashyapa I. And he ruled from 477 AD to 495. So uh, Kashyapa, he actually was was not the legitimate king. Um, there was a guy named King Datusina who ruled from 459 to 477, and he had uh, at least two sons, probably more. Um, but the mother of Kashyapa was a concubine. And so Kashyapa was, uh, he was recognized as the son of the king or one of them, but because his mother is a concubine, he's not eligible to inherit the throne, even though he's the oldest son. And there was another guy, um, his brother, Mogalana, that was supposed to be the next king. But, uh, <clears throat> but what happens is um, Kashyapa, he wants to be king, and he works with a guy named Megara, who was in charge of the military. And together, they overthrow his father, King Datushina. And then the brother, who's supposed to be the heir, he runs away. And he goes and takes refuge in India. So at first, um, 
Kashyapa has his father in prison, but then eventually he he kills him or supposedly kills him by burying him within the walls of his prison cell. So kind of like a, I guess that'd be kind of like a cask of Amontillado type of death, where the guy buries the other guy in the wall, like puts bricks up. Um, because he did that, he is not very well received by the people. And really, he wasn't the legitimate ruler anyways, especially not after doing that. So he becomes concerned about security. And he moves the capital of the kingdom to the the Great Rock Plateau, Sigaria Rock. Hmm. Um, originally, the capital was at a place called... Yeah, originally, the capital was at a place called Anu, Anuradhapura, which I could be mangling the pronunciation. Uh, but he moves it to Sigaria Rock. And he's inspired by something from their mythology. There's a legendary city called Alakamanda, which is above the clouds, and it's the city of the god Kuvira, where he lives. So his inspiration, it comes from this. And uh, normally the Buddhist kings are supposed to be somewhat moderate. I mean, obviously they're going to live better than the average person, but they're supposed to kind of show moderation. But because mm -hmm. Kashyapa is not uh, popular or legitimate, he decides to forget about all that and builds himself an extravagant complex. So when this place was built, um, it wasn't just, there was a palace built on top of the rock, but there was also stuff built on the ground as well. So there was a, uh, there was a city surrounding the royal complex. And, uh, okay, the palace is built on top of the rock, and it's got landscape terrain, kind of with terraces and gardens on the top. And there's a big rectangular pool, which is still there today. So the palace itself is, is gone. Uh, and the main entrance to this complex is on the north side. And there used to be a huge stone lion kind of sitting over the entrance. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to walk between its legs to get up in there. And yeah, I'm, looking, I'm looking at pictures. It looks like one of the, at least one of the feet still exists. Yeah. Yeah, both of the feet still exist, but um, the rest of it is gone hmm. for the most part. Um, yeah, so that's why it's called Lion Rock was because of the big lion that you had to walk through to get up into the, to the, to get up into the palace. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it decayed over time and, and only the paws are left. And um, the northern walls of Sigaria which I think we're talking about just the side of the mountain because there's a path going up. Um, the original palace where he ruled is, is gone except for like the foundation. There's nothing else left of it. Um, so the, the northern walls were originally covered entirely with plaster and painted with these frescoes. And most of these were pictures of women, either mostly naked or completely naked, and today most of it is gone, and there's only 19 figures left, all female. Um, and then there was this other thing called the mirror wall, which was, I guess, kind of like a guardrail, sort of fulfilled that function, built on the side of the path facing away from the mountain. And this was, back in the day, it was polished so smoothly that uh, it functioned as a mirror, and the king and, and others could look at themselves in it as they went up to the, to the top. Mm. Today, it is no longer a mirror. Like, you, it, you, it doesn't reflect anymore. It's still smooth, but it's covered in graffiti, actually. There's, like, centuries of graffiti that accumulated on it mm. from ancient and medieval times, visitors. Um, and at the ground level, which I'll come back to that in a second, actually, but at the ground level, there's gardens, pools, and fountains. So at the base of the mountain, there's, there was all this, uh, there's actually pipes and irrigation under the ground. And it looks like some of the fountains are still working even today. 
So then uh, the question is, you know, what happened to this place? How did it get wrecked? Yeah, so, who were the, the murals made by? Was it for the same ruler? Do they know? Or I'm looking at some of the murals uh, uh, as, as you're talking. So good question. I would say most likely, yes, it was made um, for Kashyapa and by him. And there's some people that try to say that the Buddhist monks did it and that those are those are uh, depictions of uh, Asparas or Apsaras, which is like a kind of a lesser female deity that's in Buddhism and, and Hinduism. And I need to check the spelling and pronunciation on that, actually. I, I know it starts with an A. Um, but I think probably those images were not made by Buddhist monks, because I know that to be a Buddhist monk, you've got to actually renounce women and procreation. So, I mean, whoever it is probably didn't have a religious motive when he made all those images. It looks like he had a um, probably a sexual motive because they're, well, they're naked for the most part. Yeah, I'm looking at the pictures here. Um, I'm just surprised then that the Buddhist monks kept them up if they're not deities. That's all. Yeah, I I think the Buddhist monks, um, and this is my theory, but they might have left those things in place. My guess is that originally the Buddhist monks lived in caves cut, cut into the side of the rock or which were natural caves to begin with. So probably they just lived in the caves and not the palace complex up at the top. So they probably wouldn't have walked by those things. And it may also be that they left that stuff deliberately so that tourists would come and leave a donation at the temple as they go. Okay. That, that's just my guess. But there's another possibility. Like, um, you remember when we talked about Ramayana and that mm -hmm. older tree? So yeah. in, in the Ramayana, they go down to Sri Lanka and they fight against Ravan, who is the king of Lanka. And some of the, uh, I won't put these in the sources, but uh, some of the, I came across some Sri Lankan nationalists that had blogs and they were saying that um, this place was originally the home of Ravan. And according to, um, According to the Ramayana, Ravan had lots of wives. So if he was real and he lived there, like some of them, they said that Kashyapa actually restored the glory of this place after Ravan was gone and that that's why he moved there. But of course, that's speculative. We can't really know that for sure. So I think mm -hmm. probably like there's two possibilities. One is he, he may have added to what was already there. And the other is that he put it all there himself. I doubt that uh, those paintings were for a religious purpose. That was that was there. Um, so at any rate, what happens is at, he rules for 18 years, and then Moggallana comes back from India. So all this time, Moggallana was living in India, gathering support and allies, and um, he gets an army over there and they come down and help him retake his throne. And during the fight, when it looks like he's going to lose, Kashyapa cuts his own throat. And when his brother takes the throne back, he moves the capital back to the original site. And um, this place becomes a monastery once more. He gives it over to the, to the Buddhist monks. So from about 495 AD, to either the 12th or the 13th centuries, it serves as a monastery. And then eventually it is abandoned and the forest growth kind of overtakes everything. Um, however, it's worth noting that this, this uh, place is actually mentioned in the Book of Marvels and Travels by Sir John Mandeville. So I want to just read what he says. Of course, I when we did... Um, the entry about Prester John, I used Marvels and Travels a lot, um, but he actually mentioned Sri Lanka and uh, Sigiriya is mentioned in it, although not by that name. So um, here's what Sir John Mandeville says about this place. Uh, then one reaches an island that is called Ceylon, 
which is almost 800 miles in circumference. In this land, there is much wilderness because people do not dare to live there as there are many snakes and dragons and crocodiles. These crocodiles are yellow snakes with striped backs and they have four feet and short legs and great incredible jaws, which they move over a sand, oh, when they move over a sandy path, it looks like someone has pulled a brush through the sand. There are many other kinds of wild beasts there, especially elephants. There is a mountain in this land and in the middle of this mountain, there is a plain with a great pool with a large quantity of water in it. Local people say that Adam and Eve wept on that mountain 100 years and after their expulsion from paradise. And they say that the water is their tears. In this water, there are many crocodiles and other serpents. Once a year, the local king allows poor men to get into the pool out of their love for Adam in order to gather precious stones for there are many. But because of the vermin in the water, these men smear their arms and legs with a special ointment, and then they are not scared of crocodiles or serpents. Local people say that the region's snakes and wild beasts never harm outsiders who go there, but only harm the natives. So it's a lot of uh, the stuff just sounds bogus that he says here, but it does sound like some knowledge of this rock made it all the way to Europe. And of course, this book was written, uh, Marvels and Travels was written in around 1350 AD. So that would probably be after this site was abandoned. Um, but yeah, he mentions, you know, the he describes it and mentions that the, there's a great pool there, which is correct, but there's no palace there. So I'm thinking that the Buddhists... They made no use of the palace that Kashyapa built. And one thing that often happens in the ancient world is um, structures that aren't being used sometimes get uh, scavenged and torn down and used for building materials elsewhere. So, yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Um, but basically, the site is completely abandoned. And up until 1894, there's a guy named. Harry Charles Purvis Bell, or HCP Bell, who is actually uh, working for the English government back when all this stuff was still under English rule, both India and Sri Lanka. And he begins to excavate on Sigiriya. So that's when the, they start to kind of, when interest in this place revives and they start to excavate it. And he is appointed to be the commissioner of archaeology by the English governor. And then during World War II, there's another guy uh, named Dr. Sinarat Paranavitana, who is the archaeological commissioner during World War II. And what he does is uh, he does a lot of work on Sigiriya, but he translates 685 of the graffiti verses which were written on the on the walls. A lot of these were written on the on the mirror wall. So uh, after the place is converted back to a monastery, travelers still kept coming in and visiting it, and then they would write their thoughts down on the wall or scratch it into the wall. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, there's actually poetry that's on the wall as well. And a lot of it's been translated, like you can actually get a book about it, which I haven't read, but I know that it's there. And I've and thought when put I that, put that yeah. in the links. Yeah, I can put that in the links. Yeah, there's there's one of the poems where like uh, I don't remember it exactly, but the guy says like, you know, everything is is going to age and decay, except here in this place, the beauty of these women lasts but somebody scratched off, oh, and I should mention, um, according to the wall graffiti, at one point there were 500 paintings of women on these walls. So somebody has definitely, I mean, I, I guess a lot. How many are there left? Not too many, right? What, mm. 12 or something? At, I think it's, uh, yeah, you not, not many before. are left, like 19. Okay. Yeah, 19 yeah. figures are left. That's mm. right. So, yeah, most of it, I guess a lot of it could come off with time because this is a tropical wet area. So it's probably pretty hard to, to preserve anything there. Um, mm. 
It could also be vandalism, too. And, you know, people seeking artifacts. Like, if people were touring this during the Middle Ages, maybe somebody decides to chisel off part of it and take back to his house for decoration. I mean, who's going to stop him? So, um, but when I first uh, read about this, it actually kind of reminded me of the Ramayana story. And I was, I was thinking, man, what if Ramayana was just a retelling of this, the story of Kashyapa? But I think not, because uh, Ramayana was written around 300 BC. And this happens, you know, like 400 AD. Oh, yeah, 477 to 495 AD. So, yeah, that's all I've got. Um, I don't know if it was originally the home of Ravan or not. Seems like it could be. Um, also seems like it was mentioned by Sir John Manville. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention is they did find evidence of contact with, like, uh, they found some Roman coins and I think uh, some Persian dishes. So they did have a pretty good trade network with other parts of the world. Um, but yeah, and then it was abandoned and it decayed. Today, most of the work on it is just focusing on conservation and preservation, keeping the site intact as much as possible. So. Okay. Yeah. Interesting story. Yeah, interesting place. If I had money, I would probably go there and check it out and take some pictures, but I don't. So I'll just uh, read about it. Apparently, I guess. there's also uh, a, a Tugala in Sri Lanka, which is the elephant rock. Oh, yeah? Was yeah. there out something like a giant statue of an elephant there? No, it just looks like an elephant. <laughs> There's a story that like uh, about um, how apparently they ran out of water at one point and a witch came and turned some of the animals that were drinking too much water into rocks. So one of them is was an elephant. Um, but yeah, no, they just, uh, but it was cool. I thought it was cool. You have a lion rock and then you have an elephant rock. Made me think of uh, Zelda, Breath of the Wild. But anyway. <laughs> But it looks yeah. like a cool place. I would definitely visit it as well. But it's it's very far, I think, for me to travel there. So. And if you go there, you can't you can't write about it on the mirror wall. Like you're not allowed to to write on it anymore. They put a stop to that. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Just as well, you know. Actually, there is some place I visited um, in Tennessee with my family back. Uh, I think it was almost two years ago, and there was like some old farm house and barns from the 1800s which is nothing compared with Sigiria rock but we went and toured it and inside of like the house so many people like one whole wall of the house they just scratched their names and dates and stuff into the wall and other messages and of course um now if you do it there was a sign that we passed that said if you do this now then you're going to pay a huge fine you know maybe some jail time I'm just thinking, why is it that people have the urge to vandalize? I mean, you're not even one. Of, OK, I know that when one group conquers another, they usually tear their stuff down just to kind of demoralize it, to demoralize the people and show that they're in power. But if you're just a regular person and a tourist, why do you feel the need to to vandalize something like I've never understood that? Yeah, you need her. Nobody cares about you. You're, you're not the person that built the site. So why are you going to do that? But I guess with... Um, Maybe because nobody cares about them. <laughs> yeah, they want you. They want yeah. people to care. Like, everyone yeah. will remember me. Yeah, everybody's going to remember you as a vandal and a criminal and somebody who wrecked something. So congratulations. But actually, um, I heard that some of the poetry that they carved into the mirror wall was pretty good. And my guess is that by the time they started scratching and damaging the mirror wall, it had already lost its sheen anyways. So they probably just saw it as a great place to record. Um, and maybe I'm giving them too much credit. I don't know. But. Yeah, cool story. I think it's worth uh, watching the video um, and uh, including some, some of those pictures because it looks like a cool place. I would definitely go check it out as well if I had... Uh, more time and money. Yeah. So if you're a Sri Lankan person and uh, you want to share some information with us, do leave us a comment. 
Uh, leave us a like. If we made a mistake, let us know. And uh, I think that's it. All right. Thanks, Ivor. Appreciate it. Talk to you in the, see you in the next one. All right.